He's a spy for Pakistan. <laughs> nah, he's not a Pakistani agent. He's just lazy. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sham Sharma Show. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you. So Hassan Minhaj is a comedian who has a show on Netflix called The Patriot Act and he recently did an episode on the Indian elections. So in the beginning he talks to a bunch of these Indian families who tell him not to talk about the Indian elections and he's talking to all these families and then right in the middle of it there's this batshit crazy family that says just a bunch of crazy stuff. They're going to kill you. You will be no more. There will be an accident. You will be burned to death. You're gone. Wait, who's gonna kill you? There are literally hundreds of people who have made a full-time living from just lampooning the current government. Not only are they alive, but they are thriving. I don't know what they're talking about. India is not uh, Arabia. Your name rings a bell that you are a terrorist. Period. So these people who apparently Indians consider terrorists, these so-called terrorists are some of the highest paid and most beloved movie stars in India. They're also well represented in the government, they practice their religion freely and in some cases actually have more rights than the Hindus in India. That's right, Muslims in India have the right to maintain their educational, religious and cultural organizations independently and they actually also get government support in being able to do so. But according to Article 30 of the Indian constitution, Hindus do not have that right. You may be a Pakistani, a Pakistani agent. agent. I'm a Pakistani agent. Yeah. Could be. Nah, he's not a Pakistani agent. He's just lazy. Lazy and hungry for those nice sweet YouTube clicks. Look, in this video, I will give Hassan the benefit of the doubt and apply Hanlon's razor to him. Never attribute something to malice that can be attributed to stupidity, and in Hassan's case, laziness. Talking about politics in India can get you in a lot of trouble, especially because I'm Indian <laughs> and Muslim. It's very weird to be something that people love and then also be something that people do not like. Actually, Hassan, in these so-called Hindutva circles, it is Hindus that are hated way more than any other Muslims because it is usually Hindus that say the craziest stuff. Muslims in India are usually accused of being hypocrites because they ignore blatant human rights abuses within their own culture and within their own communities while they point fingers at a culture that has always been way more tolerant than they have. Then Hassan goes on to talk about Hindu nationalism. India has grown more hostile to minority groups. Among a vocal minority, there's been a resurgence in religious nationalism, specifically Hindu nationalism. The idea that India is a Hindu nation, which completely goes against secularism, which is enshrined in the Indian constitution. We all know he's a spy for Pakistan. <laughs> nope. Still lazy. Look, India has always been a secular culture. The words secular and socialist were added and ratified undemocratically by the then Congress government of Indira Gandhi. This was a time when a lot of rights were taken away from the people of India. India has always been and will always be a secular country because India is a Hindu country. Look at Pakistan. Same genetics, same people. But why did India remain a secular country when Pakistan became an Islamic nation? Because India is a Hindu country with a Hindu civilizational ethos and even the Indian Muslims are much more liberal than the Pakistani Muslims because they are also invested in this civilizational ethos. India has never needed the word secular to be forced into its constitution to be secular. India has always been a secular nation where people from many different backgrounds and many different cultures have always coexisted together in harmony. Whether it be the Greeks, whether it be the Scythians, whether it be the Zoroastrians or the Parsis who were massacred by the Muslims in Iran, whether it be the Jews, whether it be the oppressed Tibetans, all of these people have lived in India peacefully and coexisted together. So Hindu culture doesn't need a lecture on secularism from a culture that has only recently rediscovered secularism about 300 years ago. Cheers. Also, why is it only when a culture comes into contact with Islam or Christianity that it sees violence and upheaval on an unprecedented scale? Hmm. So, Hassan talks about a few things on his show. He starts off talking about Modi and how Modi has actually never held a press conference during his tenure, 
which actually to be fair to Hassan that's a fair criticism many people that even support the BJP say that the BJP should at the very least have a press secretary the way American presidents have press secretaries so at the very least the prime minister is able to dispel some of the narratives that are created about him in the media and in the press then he goes on to say and Modi has a history of saying a lot with silence in 2002 when Modi was chief minister of the state of Gujarat he received international condemnation for not speaking out or stopping violent riots now Modi said his response was adequate and a court agreed, but almost 2,000 people were still killed. What do you mean a court agreed? We're not talking about some backwards kangaroo court, man. We're talking about the Supreme Court of India. Are you saying the Supreme Court of India's decision doesn't matter? Because despite the Supreme Court saying that Modi did not do anything wrong, Hassan carries on and attributes the blame of this riot on Modi. Again, this is extremely lazy on Hassan's part because let me tell you the true story of these riots. The riot started when in Godhra, a Muslim mob set fire to a coach of a train which was carrying Hindu pilgrims. As a result of this fire, 58 Hindu pilgrims were burnt alive, including 25 women and 15 children. I wonder why Hassan left this story out so it could fit his narrative better? Well, that's just lazy. This targeted attack on Hindus prompted a backlash from the Hindu community, which resulted in the riots. Now again, Modi was exonerated by the Supreme Court of India. But on the other hand, the other party that Hassan talks about, the Congress party, has presided over many, many more religious riots than the BJP. And most of those riots haven't even been properly investigated. If he wanted to be fair, why did he not include this information when he was talking about the Congress? Then Hassan goes on to talk about the Congress party. India that you want to see your kids grow up in is the India that people like me speak for, an inclusive party that brings in people of all regions, all languages into a common platform. That's the India of the Congress Party. So he talks about the Congress Party and he presents the Congress Party's vision for India as this wonderful, noble, secular vision. But he doesn't talk about the various discriminatory policies that the Congress government has enacted, where minorities in India have full rights to maintain their religious and cultural institutions, but Hindus do not. In fact, Hindu organizations have to declare themselves non-Hindu to be able to get the same rights. The Congress Party is a party that has presided over countless more religious riots than the BJP and they have barely even been investigated. In fact, key Congress leaders have recently been charged with actively participating in the anti-Sikh massacre of 1984 where 3,000 Sikhs were brutally murdered. So what is this Congress vision for India? Murder anyone you don't like? Well, I guess according to Hassan, at least it's a clear vision. And the corruption. Oh, the corruption. Look, to be fair to Hassan, he does talk about the corruption scandals that the Congress was involved in. But then he glosses over these scandals by saying that, oh, well, both of these parties do corruption. To me, it feels like, like describing the way HPV is. You know, how it's like, hey, come on, everybody has it. <laughs> I certainly hope that's not true. <laughs> okay. It's not just corruption charges that plague both major political parties in India. Oh, but not like the Congress, mate. Nobody does corruption like the Congress. The Congress party has turned corruption into a goddamn art form. Again, does this false equivalence make Hassan a Pakistani agent? No, it just makes him lazy. And that's probably worse for a show that's claiming to be fair and balanced. Then Hassan goes on to talk about Modi's policies. So he says that the unemployment rate has been the highest it's been in 45 years, and he quotes a leaked survey. The 2019 election is a referendum on Modi's economic promises. He promised to put Indians to work, but unemployment is the highest it's been in 45 years. Now again, this is a great example of Hassan's laziness. Because a professor from the Indian Institute of Management, Pula Ghosh, and Dr. Soumya Kanti Ghosh, who is the Chief Economic Advisor of the State Bank of India, have written a report which shows that the existing surveys to measure unemployment are most misleading. And then they give plenty of reasons as to why these surveys are misleading and what could be done to improve these surveys. Now, this information is available with just a simple Google search. So why not include the fact that these surveys that he's quoting about these unemployment data are highly misleading. So then he talks about Modi's policies and he only talks about the policy of demonetization and says that the demonetization has basically ruined the lives of poor people. Then there's Modi's signature economic policy, demonetization, an attempt to get dark money 
out of circulation. It sounds like a good idea, but it ended up being a massive failure. And look, I will agree with him that demonetization is a pretty great idea, but the implementation of it was far from ideal. Even many people that support the BJP will agree with that. And also BJP has had some problems with taking care of farmers' issues in a timely manner. But it's very interesting how Hassan only talks about two policies and then quickly moves on. Because the truth is that Modi has introduced a number of policies which has set up India and Indians to succeed in the medium and long term. Many of these policies are such that if you remove Modi from the equation, people are going to say that, oh my God, what incredible policies. For example, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. Many foreigners, when they come to India, they say that, oh, India is a dirty country. So Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched a campaign called the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, where he says that to take pride in ourselves, we have to make sure that our country is clean. He has also instituted massive tax reforms that have simplified a very complicated tax system. The implementation of the goods and services tax has simplified the tax system and has also helped Indian households in saving a lot of money. According to analysis, an average consumer is now saving about 320 rupees monthly on the purchase of commonly used goods. Not only that, the direct tax collection exceeded expectations by rupees 50,000 crores in 2018-19 as a result of the tax reform. His government has also recently ensured 100% electrification of India. They're also looking to ensure 100% internet connectivity throughout India by 2022. Modi has launched the Pradhan Mantri Jan Dhani Yojana, which is a massive scheme for financial inclusion, which aims at providing banking services to each and every household of the country. He has also launched the Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, which is another massive scheme for financial inclusion, where the government provides funds to microfinance institutions. He has also launched the Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana, which is an ambitious social welfare scheme, which aims to provide 50 million LPG connections to women from below poverty line households so they don't have to cook on wood and coal stoves. He has also launched the Ayushman Bharat scheme which will cover approximately 500 million people providing coverage up to 5 lakh rupees or $7,000 per family per year for secondary and tertiary care hospitalization. Sounds a lot like Medicare for all which the liberals love. Now all of these schemes have been designed to uplift the poorest sections of the population and help them join the mainstream of the country and set up the Indian economy for success in the future. And all of these schemes honestly sound like schemes that liberals would love. So there's still good schemes even if Modi brings them in, right? No, no, no. Then he talks about this. The BJP is currently trying to strip almost 4 million mostly Muslim immigrants of their right to vote in the state of Assam. If they get away with it, it will be the single largest voter disenfranchisement in recorded history. Well, yes, it would be horrible if it was true and if these immigrants were legal. A study by the South Asia Research Society in Calcutta has shown that the people that he is talking about are illegal immigrants. What country in the world would be happy with allowing illegal immigrants the right to vote the way legal immigrants and citizens of the country have? Makes no sense. Then he talks about Modi and his connection with the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangha. He talks about how Modi is a horrible person because the RSS is a horrible organization. And he talks about one of the great leaders of the RSS called Guru Golwalkar. It's easy to laugh at the cosplay wing of the RSS, but they have some concerning beliefs. They have long relied on a book. And I swear this is the real title of the book. It's called Bunch of Thoughts. Yeah, well, that's because that's exactly what it was. It was a bunch of thoughts. It was a text that Golwalkar wrote when he was 32 and not even part of the RSS. And he himself took the book out of circulation in the 40s because he did not agree with what he said in the book previously. So it's very interesting that the left doesn't believe in the evolution of people that they don't like. For example, they like Obama. And so when Obama changed his stance on gay marriage, they forgave him immediately. So if Obama can be forgiven for changing his views, why can't Gold Walker be forgiven for changing his views? And again, he's saying that the BJP relies on this book. The BJP doesn't rely on this book. The BJP's constitution lays out that its values are derived from the concept of integral humanism, which was a concept developed by Deen Dayal Upadhyay. Integral humanism means that the human being is at the core position of the social, political, and economic model. It is opposed to both Western liberalism and Marxist socialism, which it views as materialistic ideologies incapable of dealing with native problems of India. It believes that the four aims or purusharthas of human beings are 
dharma, artha, kama and moksha. Integral humanists consider that materialists advocate only artha and kama, negating the other two. Integral humanists believe that all the three aims, that is dharma, artha and kama, are essential to achieve liberation or moksha. That doesn't sound like a fascist ideology, does it? And not just that, the leader of the RSS recently came out and said that Muslims are always going to be part of Indian society. The day that Muslims are not part of Indian society, we will lose our Hindutva. But again, he's a little too lazy to put all this stuff in his show because that's gonna hurt the agenda. Violence against all minorities has gone up. Take, for example, the phenomenon known as cow lynchings. Thousands of people have taken to the streets across India to protest against rising attacks on Muslims and Dalits by vigilante cow protection groups. Then he comes to the issue of cow lynchings and he says cow lynchings are how we can see that Hindu nationalism is getting out of hand. So the narrative is that Muslims are being beaten and killed around the country in the name of cow protection. So let's look at these facts. According to research done by scientist and political commentator Anand Ranganathan, there really isn't much of a difference between cow-related incidents before and after the election of Modi. Secondly, the two organizations that news outlets quote most often when talking about these incidents of cow violence are India Spend and Fact Checker. But research has shown that both of these organizations have a very shoddy methodology. In fact, India Spend was finding out data about cow lynchings by just doing keyword search on Google. They didn't even try to include any reports from local newspapers. And these organizations often deliberately ignore Muslim on Hindu violence. There's a great report that has been done by an independent journalist called Swati Goel Sharma that shows this bias as well. So please, I would really recommend that you go check it out. I will leave a link to that article in the description down below. So the fact that the number of these incidents before Modi and after Modi has stayed the same shows that the real reason behind this cow violence isn't really Hindu radicalization. It's a poor law and order situation and lack of police reforms. The police in India is very highly understaffed. So they're often not able to take smaller cases like a couple of cows being stolen from a village from a family they have to try and focus on the more high profile cases. On top of that, violent cattle smuggling is a very real issue that the media often ignores because the perpetrators are often Muslims and the victims often Hindus. This is a very real phenomenon where people get killed for trying to protect their cattle from being stolen by the smugglers. Look, a cow may not mean much to a middle class person, but for a poor farmer in rural India, a cow can be their entire livelihood. And because police is so understaffed and they can't look into these individual cases, cases of cattle theft, people feel like they have no option but to take the law into their own hands if they want to protect themselves from incidents of cow smuggling. So the best way to solve this problem is to solve the law and order issue and police reform and get more police out to tackle these issues. And that is a genuine criticism that can be made of the Modi government that they have not done enough to bring in police reform and solve the law and order situation. So look again, at the end of the day, if Hassan truly cared about being fair, being balanced and tell this story of the Indian elections and Indian politics truthfully. He would not have hidden key facts so that he could give the story any color that he wanted. So in my opinion, there's a lot of dishonesty in this video. I don't believe Hassan is a Pakistani agent and that claim is just bullshit. I think he's lazy and I think he cares more about getting clicks on his show and pats on the back and brownie points in virtue signaling from his liberal friends rather than telling the truth. And that's a shame, but as long as he enjoys those juicy clicks and juicy views, I don't think he's going to care. All right, guys, that was today's episode. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, let me know what you thought about this video by Hassan Minhaj as well. Let me know your thoughts and comments in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to leave a like, leave a thumbs up. It helps me out and it helps the show out. If you feel like you found this video to be of value, if you feel like you found this video useful, please make sure to share this video as widely as you can. If you like the Sham Sharma show and if you'd like to support the Sham Sharma show, please make sure to go to the Patreon link in the description down below, become a patron of the show and support the show however you'd like. If you like today's episode, if you like the Sham Sharma show and you haven't subscribed already, make sure to go down and click the subscribe button. You can also click over here to subscribe. I will see you for the next episode. Until then, stay happy, stay healthy and I'll see you soon.